Welcome everybody. I did the order of the drinks. Also, if you have a question, put it in the chat or raise your hand. Laurie will call on you. Um, but we are going to so. We are going to start with uh, the Bosch tea spritzer. Will be number one. Drink number two is the King Cup. Drink number three is Mordecai Smash. Drink number four is ha Hammered Heyman. And drink number five is the Estherita. Um, tonight we have Rabbi Stern is going to explain um, who all the characters are. And we have Alyssa Gusanoff, who is the author of a cocktail mocktail book. And um, she is came up with these fantastic recipes. And then we have our bar back. Stacy Schwartz. Um, Rabbi? Yes. So look, we are always thinking of new ways to celebrate ancient holidays. We've been celebrating Purim for a couple thousand years, more or less. And we've often wondered, how can we do this in a fresh way? And earlier today, uh, we had our Purim spiel with the kids. And of course, it was fun. But there's a thing about uh, adult participation and what we want to do and how we want to do it. And drinking alcohol is most definitely a part of that tradition. Um, in fact, from the Talmud, it says you're supposed to, on Purim, uh, drink so much so that when you can't tell the difference between the name of Haman and the name of Mordecai. Ooh. And periodically, that, whenever you hear the name Haman, yeah. uh, we will be making noise or doing something utterly inappropriate. Losing. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the idea of not being able to tell who's the hero, who's the villain, um, is a very interesting statement in and of itself about who is the good guy, who is the bad guy, what is the story all about. So we're going to try to do the best of all possible worlds, which is a little bit of Jewish learning and a little bit of fine drinking. And Alyssa Gusana, who, who really, we talked to her about this idea because she is known uh, for many things, including her acumen. Uh, with mixed drinks, both real and uh, mocktails. And we brought the suggestion and like she was on it and you were going to see that the, the recipes we have, I think you're gonna really enjoy. Now, some of you might be going five, you know, five mixed drinks, that's, that's a pretty serious clip. And we understand and we're not suggesting you should do all five, you have the recipes. I hope you'll look them over and decide which one mm, appeals to your taste. Or if you wanna go the distance, that's good too. But uh, don't worry about us. We have someone here with an alcohol indicator so that we know, a breathalyzer. <laughs> so we're very legal on this end. And if not, we will be curried, curried home, curried for, for dinner. Anyway. And no, you have not started. <laughs> and we have not even started yet. We're just drinking salsa. So. so in this story of porn, we have certain fundamental characters and each character is represented with a different drink. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get started. I'm gonna hand it over to Alyssa and she will begin with mixing the first drink. And um, as she tells you what's in it, then I'll give you just a little bit of background of who this character is and how they relate to the broader idea of the holiday form. And with that, Hi, I'm Alyssa Gassanoff. Um, the book I wrote, Margarita Mama, Mocktails for Moms to Be. Um, started about 15 years ago when I was pregnant with my oldest son. It has since evolved to not only just mocktails, but also cocktails and different events and different cocktails that are specialized for each event. So I'm really excited tonight to share the porn recipes that I came up with. The rabbi had a great idea to make each drink specific to the character. And I had a lot of fun creating a specific recipe for each character. Um, when we're making the drinks, your recipes will call for one part. I'm gonna use a shot glass. You can use anything you have at home that's a measure. Most cocktails are based more on ratios than actual measurements. Um, so if you're feeling ambitious and you wanna use a bigger measuring cup, go to it. Um, you can use a liquid measuring cup. For one part, I would try one ounce to two ounces um, as a starting point for the ratio. But most cocktails don't have to be precise. You can bring out that middle school math and do some ratios and actually put it to use, so. Great, so let's get started. The first drink is the Vashti Spritzer. Um, we added uh, vodka, iced tea, 
passion fruit juice and seltzer. So we're gonna start with ice in a tall glass and then two parts of vodka. Well, so does it matter? So there's all kinds of different vodkas on the market. Do you pick Tito's for any particular reason? Well, it's not Russian. Um, Good, thank you very much. <laughs> and I like Tito's. I think it has a very smooth flavor, but people have different preferences. I was just saying that we were in St. Croix and they actually make vodka out of breadfruit. And I thought that was one of the smoothest vodkas I've ever had, but it's a long trip to get it. So Tito's is priced right. And I think very drinkable in any sort of a mixed drink. Um, I added one part of the unsweetened iced tea. You could definitely use sweetened iced tea if you like drinks on the sweeter side. Um, next, we're going to add some passion fruit juice. And then one part. One part of that. And then this is the most imprecise part where you just take your seltzer and you're going to top it off to add a little fizz and to cut down on the alcohol some. Um, our bar back nicely wedged some lines for us, so I'll Stacey. squeeze that in. <laughs> and then give it a mix with a straw or a spoon, and you can be the official taster. Thank you, and then I'll be able to say a little about why this is the drink for lunch. Very tasty. The Ingredient that's been given, giving it the most taste, of course, is the passion fruit. Why does Vashti get the passion fruit? Because she was a vibrant and strong female character in a time and in a book that is rarely about strong females. Vashti is asked by King Ahasuerus to perform a dance for his guests. And by a dance, we infer that it's something involving nakedness, lewdness, perhaps some issues involving sex. Um, she was kind of like at an orgy and she, uh, the king wanted her to be the prime uh, object of affection or attention. And Vashti says no. Uh, and Ahasuerus, uh, in that pre uh, Me Too moment, uh, consigns her uh, to uh, be beheaded, sends her off. And what we remember about Vashti in this story is that this king is confronted. And when confronted, his response is typically a murderous response, which will become important in the story later on. So for Vash Vashti's passion and for her strength, uh, we have this delicious drink, uh, Vashti Spritzer. And uh, you don't only have to drink it on forum. I understand that it is perfectly good any time of year. This would actually be a good summer drink. Yes, we used it tonight to start not only because it was Vashti, but also it's a lighter drink. So it's a good intro to some of the heavier, stronger cocktails we'll be getting. Right, we're going to get pretty, pretty serious. We're going to get <laughs> we're getting serious. Um, Stacy, any comments about the drink? I think it's delicious. <laughs> very, very <laughs> yummy, people. Look, I am. Look, I am. Look, I am. Folks, I hope that you're, those of you who chose, <laughs> those of you who chose uh, to, to make this as your first drink, uh, let us know in the chat what you think. And also, you know, if you are a mixologist, uh, something maybe you add, is there a garnish that you think would go with, isn't it? We're, we're all ears. We want to hear. So we Before we move on, does anyone have any questions about this drink? I'm going to take this off because... Could you repeat the ingredients, please? We are a little behind. Do you want me to read it? Right. You... Uh, the right. Vashti Spritzer is two yeah. parts of vodka. So again, using whatever measuring glass you're using, you're going to take two parts of vodka. You're going to use a large glass filled with ice, so a tall glass that you have at home. You're going to add the two parts of vodka, one glass full of unsweetened <laughs> iced tea. Okay. And one part passion fruit juice. If you're not able to find passion fruit, I know some people had trouble finding that. Any sort of juice will work to sort of sweeten it up, um, especially since we use the unsweetened iced tea. When you have that in your glass, you can give it a little mix. Then you can top it off with the seltzer and squeeze a lime into it. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So on from Vashti, in opposition to Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus is the king of Shushan. It is a mythic territory that we think extends in the area that now would be Persia. 
point about the story, there is no evidence that any of this, that there ever was a King Ahasuerus or a Queen Esther or a Mordecai. None of this is based on any evidence of having actually happened. It's a story about survival, about identity, about strength, about resilience, uh, which makes it extra special, I think, for us to tell. So we were introduced to Vashti, the woman that dared to defy the king with terrible results. We go on now to talk about Ahasuerus. And I'm going to give you a little more about this king, who we know had a pretty tough temper and uh, surrounded himself with luxury and with uh, psychophants who did whatever he asked them to do. But now let's find out a little more about what we make for such a guy. Absolutely. So I think one of the most important parts of this drink for the regal king is the glass. Um, a metal Moscow mule glass really makes you feel special when you're drinking it. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna fill it with some ice. Oh, far back. I'm sorry, we have a spell. <laughs> spell mile <laughs> three, Stacy. Um, and then we're going to add two parts of vodka again. And instead of making a traditional Moscow meal, we wanted to make it a little special for the king. Um, so we added elderflower, which gives it a nice, sweet, slightly floral taste. I'm going to do one part of elderflower. Some people are familiar with St. Germain, which is an elderflower in the core. This is another one, um, St. Elder, that can be found at most liquor stores and is a lower price point than St. Germain. That. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I want to smell that while you're. Oh, sure. And once you have those in, we're going to fill it with ginger beer, which is also readily available at grocery stores and liquor stores. Again, you can garnish it with a lime wedge. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. It's a good mixer. I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's a own. very vegetal kind of um, taste. Right. I think together with the vodka and the ginger beer, it really brings out the ginger. Mm. So there is something very cooling about this very regal, very, you have a mysterious drink here. And Alvaros was the potentate par excellence. He represented everything about how Jews looked at rulers who, you know, their destiny was in their hands. And um, Ahasuerus gets this, and Ahasuerus becomes the key player in what happens to the Jews of Shushan. But in the meantime, I'm there. Okay. We'll give you a couple minutes to make those drinks and let us know if you have any questions. I would say the elderflower adds something kind of nice uh, as opposed to the Moscow meal. It gets you a little right. different kind of flavor. It rounds really it good. a little bit. Yeah. You whispered at it. <laughs> you just want to say it out loud, whatever you I want to taste it in that cup. Okay, yeah. Just take a, I mean, no, no, it's coming right here for you, Stacey. Don't worry. Do I get the cool? In all establishments, the bar back gets to drink. <laughs> True. Part of the deal. Achishveros, when he loses Vashti, and you know, he had a harem, and one of the things that he wants is someone to replace Vashti. And uh, he decides that he's going to cast about uh, for a, a new queen, a new part of the harem. And this is the way that Esther gets involved in the story too. But next, our next drink is going to Mordecai. Okay, can we just, anyone have any questions yes, about this we, drink? I don't want to go right, ahead well, we down our ice ball. Ball. Bar back needs to get more ice. Do you need more ice? Um, yeah, but yeah. Okay. Lori, any questions out there? Okay. Okay. We're ready okay. to move We're on. on. Mordecai is probably the strongest character in the story, so we needed a very, very strong drink for him. So the key ingredient of this is Navy Strength Gin. Any gin will work, but for this character-inspired drink, we chose Navy Strength because it has a higher 
a higher alcohol content than regular gin. Um, sweet vermouth and Campari, which are all strong, all alcoholic mixers. And then I wanted something to round it out a little bit. So for him, we're gonna use a splash of pineapple juice. When I was trying to think about what fruit was strong, there was something about a pineapple that seemed very strong where it has that tough exterior, but a sweet interior where Mordecai was really kind. Um, and I thought he balanced well with that drink. So for this one, we are also gonna use the shot glass to measure. We are gonna do one and a half parts of the Navy Strength Gin. Feel free to do two. I was trying to be a little lenient on this since we have a lot of other drinks. Um, I didn't want it to be too strong for anyone. <laughs> the other thing for this one is I really like to use a giant ice cube. It will melt slower and prevent watering down your drink. Um, it also allows you to use a larger glass and it will fill it, you'll see. Um, Where end. did you get uh, the big ice cube maker tray? So they're available most places. I would say Amazon would be a good default place sure. to look. It'll right. probably be your house tomorrow if you order it right now. Right. Um, William Sonoma also sells them. Eileen's of William Sonoma, Sonoma sells it too. So they're very easy to find. Um, we're gonna do one part Campari, which looks sweet, but it's actually sort of a dry liqueur, more of a citrus, and one part sweet vermouth. This is a drink that I love to garnish with a dehydrated orange slice. We tried to keep it simple since everyone was at home in their own kitchen. And we had already given you a pretty good shopping list, but an orange slice or a dehydrated orange wheel would be a great topper for this. And then we're gonna add a half a part of pineapple juice. Well, there we go. Um, how, also, how does this compare to a tradition that grown? So a traditional- What's your take off on it? So we added the pineapple juice and then we added smash for more to, uh, cause it just sounded like a stronger drink, but it is a pretty traditional Negroni. Would have gin, Campari and vermouth. Some people don't like gin. Gin can have a very herbal taste to it. Um, cocktails are pretty interchangeable. So go with what you like. If you don't like gin, this could absolutely be made with vodka. It could be made with bourbon, um, tequila. It could really blend with anything that is a liquor of choice in your house. It's very delicious and it's also, <laughs> right, for, pe for people who it's a strong one. are not used to Negronis, it's a, it's a, it's a right. serious drink, uh, as a Mordecai is a serious guy. Uh, and if you're not used to it, it can be a little uh, overwhelming, a little intimidating, I think it's a drink. Um, but if you, uh, so if you decide you wanna order Negroni, do you think this is the people over trying Negronis as an after dinner drink, or is it usually prior to, to doing um, drinks and cocktails? I see it more on sort of a cocktail menu beforehand. It is yeah. a strong cocktail. If you're ordering a drink out, it's one they cannot water down for you because it's right. all the ingredients in it have an alcohol content. Um, but it is strong and it's not sweet. So it definitely appeals to some people and may not be on other people's top five list. It's one of those drinks, if you go out, it's a little on the sophistication um, meter, it's kind of up there a little bit more. Um, Mordechai is this key player because it's Mordechai who uh, gets into a significantly difficult situation, which is he uh, he's standing on the street and uh, he is listening to a sound. And what is he listening to? He's listening to a couple of eunuchs. Um, who work for the harem for King Ahasuerus. And he hears them, and one of them is talking about plotting to kill King Ahasuerus. And Mordechai uh, finds out, he lets the authorities know, he saves the king's life. And uh, this is a key moment uh, in the story. Mordechai understands, so then he becomes this guy with, with some very important knowledge. And as luck would have it, uh, the next day, uh, he is out and uh, he sees coming down the street, the prime minister uh, for the king, Haman. Boom. Haman, uh, as you remember, the archetypal villain, he is considered to be one of the terrible guys. Uh, you know, he is compared to Amalek. And he is compared to Arafat. He's compared to Hitler, to Stalin, to all of the bad guys in Jewish history. 
um, um, came in is one of them. And he believes as the prime minister that everyone must bow down to him. And everybody bows except for Mordechai. Mordechai says, I will only bow before one, and that is before the Holy One, never to a human being. Which is interesting because I just read this fascinating commentary that suggests that Mordechai was actually seeking his own personal political gain in this, and that he put all the Jewish people at stake for his own interpretation of how he himself should be treated. That is, in Jewish law, even though idolatry is forbidden, was Haman asking to be worshipped. Yeah, he was asking to bow down to. So the, Mordechai's act, we're, we're not quite sure. And I never thought about this. And I'm always glad when I find some sort of new or interesting commentary. And, and this is just such a moment. And um, Mordechai so upsets Haman that... Uh, that, that um, he decides he's going to not only kill kill Mordechai, he's going to kill all the Jews. And it's for that reason that Mordechai decides, I know I'm going to uh, have my niece, we're not quite sure his relationship to Esther. My, his niece, his stepdaughter, we're not exactly sure, but he suggests that she join this famous uh, uh, competition to become the new queen. And uh, it is, some people say, isn't Mordecai kind of pimping out Esther? And uh, you can read it. It's an ancient story with an ancient context. I'm not going to get into judging. But the fact is that Esther, a Jewish woman, hides her identity and becomes, in fact, the chosen one by King Ahasuerus. And now we have a setup to have the king who wants to kill the Jews, who has just chosen a woman who is secretly Jewish. Yes, King's Cup, secretly Jewish. And now the question is, how do we resolve this tension? Because technically, if all the Jews are going to be killed by Haman, then that means the queen, of course, would be, have to be executed as well, which... It's not going to go down too well with Akashverus with me. Anyway, so we just keep going with the story. We're going forward. And what do we go with? Next? Switch places. We're going to move. Eileen, we do Amen. have a question. Amen. Eileen, Eileen. 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 we do have a question for the mixologist from Mark Carney. He says he typically, typically uses a shaker when making a mixed drink. Is there a general rule about when to pour over ice or use a shaker? Excellent question. It's definitely a personal preference. Um, for online classes, I find a shaker can be loud and it can be hard to hear, which is why I am not using a shaker. What? <laughs> of course, <speedy laughs> we do a noise maker, so maybe I could have thought <laughs> a shaker could have doubled as a grogger for tonight. Um, you absolutely can use a shaker. When you shake a drink over ice, some of the ice will melt and it will dilute the drink slightly. So if you use a shaker and then pour it over ice, you are diluting the drink. Um, I would typically use a shaker and then pour it straight up for a lot of drinks that are straight up. For simplicity, we did drinks over ice tonight. We also aren't doing any blended drinks because the blender would also fall in the noisy category. Um, but you'll see for our final ester drink, you actually could put that one in a blender and make a frozen margarita. We just tried to simplify it for the Zoom platform. I bet Mark Carney's a classy guy. I bet, <laughs> I, I bet his shaker, like it's one of those really fancy martini shakers. <laughs> The, Mark, do you make a, a good martini? Mark Carney, you want to unmute? No, Rabbi wants to do know. Do you make a good martini? If you have your, if you're asking about shakers, then you can spin around. Are you unmute? Unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Yes. Uh, yes, I try to make a good. Martini. I try. I do my best. He tries and does his best. What, what's your what's your go to martini? <laughs> you need to ask my wife. She's the one that drinks. I'm really a bourbon guy, but I make some martinis. So can, can you hear me? I'm sorry. No, you when you're me? breaking up, I'm having a hard time hearing. Yeah. Sorry, Pat. Sorry. I have no problem. Don't know what's wrong. Sorry. Yeah, it's like muffled. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think you're a little too close. Back up a little bit. Can you hear me? That's a little better. 
Go ahead. No, Sounds like there's something in front of us. Have you been shaking already? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering. I don't know what you on the spot, Mark. I just, I just thought the question you asked was really like sort of deeper in the technique of preparing uh, cocktails, and uh, I had a feeling you must have a go-to martini. And given that you're from the south, I wonder if you're a mint julep guy. I think that oh, that could be a possibility. It's so good. Um, so good. But anyway, maybe we maybe get in the chat. Tell us about that. But let, let's. Uh, you know, let's we have one more question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Um, from Lorette, uh, she's wondering if other alcohols yeah. have different mm -hmm. strengths, and also a question about the ice, yeah. ice size and cuts she has learned can make a difference. Can you explain more about that? Sure. Gin is one of the spirits I know that comes in different strengths. I think. There may be some variations in tequilas and vodkas, but they tend to be similar. Um, bourbons also can have different proofs. Now there's so many different boutique spirits that you really almost have to check the bottles if that's something that you're looking for, a stronger one. There also is a new market for lower proof spirits um, for less alcohol. So there is definitely a greater range than there used to be. Um, as far as the ice, I am not a physics person, but my mixology understanding is if you have a bigger ice cube, it's going to melt slower. Um, so that would prevent the dilution of a drink. So um, a drink that you want over ice, like the Bosch de Spritzer that's light, and we don't care if it gets a little more watery, is fine to do over regular size ice cubes. Any of these drinks will work with regular size ice cubes. If you have or you feel like investing in it for future cocktails, the larger ice cubes will keep your drink colder without watering it down. And they look really cool. And they yeah. do. They really do. They make round ones too. They make all sorts of different shapes now. So I just got a breaking text from Sandy. And Mark <laughs> is in good luck coming up because his drink of choice contains bourbon. And our next uh, drink is a bourbon drink. He's a bourbon guy. Good yeah, Perfect. So for the hammer Cayman, there is nothing friendly in this <laughs> Nothing friendly. We're going to start with bourbon. Um, we're going to add ancho rays, which is probably one of my favorite mixers. It is a great substitute for sweet vermouth. It has a nice heat on the finish. It's not as smoky as other smoked drinks. I'm not a fan of smoked tequila, and so this doesn't have that flavor to it, but it does give sort of a little hint of a woodsy spice to it. Hmm. We're going to add bitters, maybe a few extra bitters, because Heyman was bitter. Boo! <laughs> Bitters are bitter sounding. They're actually not as bitter tasting when they're mixed in a cocktail um, as they sound. Oh, great mixologist. Do you know anything about like bitters? Like what, what it's made from, what the story is about this? I think it's sort of just a condensed concentrate. It's alcoholic. There, there, there's alcohol I'm, in it, I think. Very it? little, I think. Um, Cause they're sold all over at gift stores that wouldn't be able to carry Which is 44% oh, alcohol content. I mean, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, I just I don't know anything no, I, about, uh, um, if anyone knows something about bitters, yeah. let us know. We would love to hear about Maybe it. Maybe it's because you only use a couple of drops. Maybe. Well, well, like for high, sure. It'd be like the cough syrup realm. Right. <laughs> I would not recommend using cough syrup. Yeah, or drinking vanilla. No, please. <laughs> the robot has some special. Um, so we're going to add one part of the ancho rays. This can be adjusted um, depending on if you like spice, if you don't like spice. If you're completely anti-spice, sweet vermouth would work very well in here. Mm. I'm going to add a few drops of, for this I picked orange bitters. I like the citrus. They make chocolate bitters, cherry bitters. Mm. They make ones that are more woodsy. They come in a dropper, very scientific. One, two, three, four. <laughs> we added an extra one because he's extra bitter. And then this is the one thing that I would measure. Lemon juice can be pretty tart. Mm. So we're going to do half a teaspoon. We have a question. Is Ancho Reyes, is that a tequila? It is not a tequila. It is I it's a liqueur. just a liqueur. Found next to tequila, though. In the That program. may vary yeah. store to store, but... It's, I don't it's know a Mexican only... liqueur. Maybe that's so why it's made tequila. It's, yeah. There's a lot of tequilas from Mexico, but I don't think there's no tequila in it. And it's definitely a much lot um, lower proof than tequila. It must be because of the Mexican origins. Um, we have a breaking message from Eris. You have to make me one tonight. <laughs> that's what she wants us to keep. Yes. <laughs> okay. 
Who's, did we, are we keeping track of who's at this point? No, <laughs> that's a new one. Oh, wait, yeah, you did have your assigned colors. They're getting, they're getting smaller. You were supposed to use your small blue straw for this one. <laughs> All right, so this is the hammered payment. Yeah. What is it? As I said, Heyman is the, the, villain par, the villain par excellence. And here he is in a move where he has managed to take the power given to him by the king, King Ahasuerus, using it to his own personal end. Ahasuerus, who has no real interest in his domestic policy, uh, what he's interested in is the acquisition of wealth. He doesn't really care much about anything except his gold, his women, his parties, his status. Um, in this case, Heyman takes over the, <laughs> his vacuum and um, is asserting his own power, uh, including the notion that he can take this minority, these Jews, and destroy them with no negative, uh, uh, no negative results for him personally. So. I'm going to take a little sip of this. Yes. I am. I am. I am. Oh, oh my God. Stacey's back on the spritzer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, it, it just hasn't mellowed like a mint julep yet. This is so, this it's delicious. <laughs> is take uh, a, a serious drink. Um, it has more <laughs> alcohol feel uh, than uh, the, the Mordechai. Right. It definitely burns more going down, which is more fitting for Heyman. He's Absolutely. Boo! Absolutely. It and takes a little of space. Heyman just made my bourbon. eyes tear. So that's appropriate. It is appropriate. Uh, what is happening in this moment, not in the moment that we're drinking this, uh, what's happening in this moment is now that Heyman has plotted against the Jews. He is ready to go. And uh, Mordechai uh, who is amongst those who will die, goes to Esther and says, look, it's up to you. You're going to have to intervene to save us. It's up to you. You're going to have to reveal your identity in order to save us. You can't be a bystander. You have to get involved. And this is a really hard moment for her because she is now in a place of status and in a place of um, great potential power. In the meantime, what we also find out is that uh, Ahasuerus probably gets drunk or whatever. He can't sleep. He wakes up. He calls one of his eunuchs who reads him from his daily chronicles. What's happening in the world? Midrin, and he reads about this guy named Mordechai who saved him. Ahasuerus doesn't know. He's so high up in the echelons of, of power. And like a president that we actually had, he doesn't really care about the day-to-day -day running of the country. <laughs> or of the world. If it doesn't affect him directly, he doesn't know about it. But when he finds out there's a story that somebody saved his life, it's like, oh, I want to know. I want to, I want to celebrate this guy. So he says to Haman, in a parade, he goes, oh, great. I'm going to have this great parade. He goes, no, no, it's not for you. It's for this Jew named Mordechai. Now Haman is Mordechai. Yeah. And this even makes him more resolved to want to kill Mordechai and the Jews. So now it's all set. The drama is rolling forward. We have these forces of good and evil lined up. What will Esther do? Which leads to our final drink, which is actually the mocktail of the night. Although we won't tell anyone if you add tequila, if anyone's looking for more after <laughs> where we've been. Um, Growing up, everyone dressed up like Queen Esther for the Purim Carnival. I always thought she was the hot shot. And then talking to Rabbi, he's like, we need a boring drink for her. He's like, she's really plain and boring. So we kept this one really plain and simple. So for the mar margarita that we're going to do over ice, I would start with ice. Casey so nicely juiced half an orange. <laughs> half a lime. The lime is really tart. We want the tartness for the margarita, but we also want some sweetness. So instead of buying the pre-made margarita mixes that I think have a lot of extra stuff in it that you don't need, we're gonna add two ounces of limeade or two parts of limeade. 
We'll mix it. And for this one, we're just going to top it off with a little ginger ale or ginger ale or tequila. Tequila is a great substitute for ginger ale. Or ginger ale is a great <laughs> substitute for tequila, depending on we don't what tequila. you're looking for. And that's the Esterita. Esterita. Do we have any questions before we sip this uh, next one? Is anyone still alive after the hammer hammer? Right, really. <laughs> <is it. laughs> All right. So this is a basic margarita mix. This is a but basic margarita made. mix. You could absolutely um, substitute tequila for the ginger ale. What's up with the salt? What's up you with could that definitely salt the rim. It's more for the tequila so for a mocktail you could do it if you're trying to fake someone out less necessary um is that always been kind of part of the mystique of the drink is i think so i think a lot of the garnishes are sort of for the appearance they don't necessarily change it i don't think anyone would say i like salt on my margaritas but i would gladly drink one without the salt. it took me years to one <laughs> i think i was like wanted to clean it up <laughs> but um, and now it's become very trendy bloody mary's a lot of times will now have the old yes. bay rims on yes. it it's become a big thing Eileen was saying she saw cosmopolitan sugar. Um, nice. I know the lemon drop martinis are sometimes coming with a sugared rim. So I think it's a novelty more than actually changing. I'm going to taste, taste this. I would like you to tell us about the lemon drop martini. Would you tell us about that? And then how you would make that? And then I'm going to taste this and then we'll. Sure. So I don't like things super sweet. So I'll be honest, lemon drop is not usually my drink of choice, but I would start with the lemon vodka. And then I would add some lemonade or just some press squeezed lemon juice. And then I would add a splash of limoncello. Uh, Sophia in West Roxbury has a fantastic lemon drop martini with the sugar rub. Perfect. <laughs> Are there any other questions on any of the drinks? That's actually um, really good. Yes. So for any of the kids in the audience, go make this margarita mocktail. It's really good. We're getting a lot of comments about how awesome Alyssa is. Yes. Oh, I want to know fantastic. what Alyssa's favorite drink is. Can I ask that? Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. My favorite drink is a Negroni. Oh, oh. Or a vodka martini with blue cheese stuffed olives, but I won't drink Ooh, it without the blue yummy. cheese olives. And why is it? I love the blue cheese olives. So it's an excuse to have the yes. olives? Yes. I Do you find the Campari is a, a, a acquired taste? Because that's yes. what really makes that drink a little yes, bitter, it's right? It's definitely a little bitter with the citrus. I think. I don't like sweet drinks, so that's why it's a perfect drink for me. Um, the only sweet drink that I will drink is I've gotten into espresso martinis. Oh, yes. um, the best one is at Fratelli's at the Encore. It's worth it's worth going for. Um, but that can be made with vanilla vodka, um, an actual shot of espresso, Kahlua, and sometimes Bailey's. Um, and those are great, great after dinner drinks. You were asking about the yes. Negroni after dinner. I would skip the Negroni and have the espresso martini. You know, there's a fabulous. Uh, espresso flavored tequila um i don't know what's the what's the big labels for the higher end tequila i know there's a hundred of them but it's there's the orange and the green label oh, oh, i know the, like a the, lot of you know the we patron. Buy a patron. Yeah, that's there's a there's a patron uh i think the espresso flavored tequila. Oh, it's oh, just it's a fabulous after dinner like over match. ice yeah so out of all the drinks that we made, Rabbi, which was your favorite? I'm going to tell you in a minute. Oh, sorry. Before, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's too far back. Me. Far, far back. back. Oh, Shut yeah. up, far back. Far Let's back, go back. Far back, go back. What I want to do is get, get to the uh, end of the story, because here we are. <laughs> sorry. And uh, Mordechai convinces <laughs> Esther to go and confront King Ahasuerus about this horrible plot that's being uh, actively activated against the Jews. And it's a dangerous thing because you do not go to the king unless you are summoned. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're the prime minister, whether you're the deputy, whether you're one of the women in the harem, you do not go unless you are summoned. But it is Queen Esther who walks into the throne room unannounced, not invited. And she says, look, uh, I want to invite Haman Ooh. Ah! to a lunch in the garden. And um, the king said, well, this is highly unusual, but okay. You know, anyway. And so they go, they meet in the garden. There's a beautiful lunch spread. I'm sure there's great, uh, you know, there's great salads, and fruits, and there's a fantastic array of um, spiced items, all the great food of Persia is laid out. 
and they're eating and enjoying in Haman. I was invited here by the queen. I am one lucky guy. Look at me. And as they're finishing uh, dessert, she goes, well, King Ahasuerus, you're going to have to say goodbye to me. He goes, what are you talking about? She says, well, I'm going to die, as are all the Jews of Persia. He says, like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And she says, yes, there's a decree that all over the kingdom. He goes, I made no such decree. Who made such a decree? And, of course, at this point, Haman, very uncomfortable, and he kind of runs out into the garden, and the king gets up, he's, he's furious. Haman kind of makes a loop back, and he says, oh, if I, don't, I didn't know you were Jewish, if I'd known you were Jewish, you know, some of my, my best friends are Jewish, and he, uh, and again, it's a pretty racy story, he, he gets on his knees, and he goes to like beg forgiveness, he puts his head in the lap of Queen Esther. At this moment, Ahasuerus comes back into the room. He sees the queen uh, uh, sitting there with Haman in her lap. <laughs> and as you might imagine, Ahasuerus' uh, personality, he says, take him and hang him until he's dead. Uh, and not only hang him, but hang all of his sons, and then it gets kind of <laughs> homicidal. But, uh, in this moment, then, what happens is that Esther is victorious by revealing herself as a Jew. She saves the people. She saves the kingdom by daring to face truth to power, by going into Ahasuerus unannounced, by taking the biggest of all risks, which is to be there not just for herself, but for her people. And Woo-hoo, you go, girl! She goes, <laughs> she is so dynamite. She's not for it. Well, no, I, I, I think she, until the end. No, I, no, I, I think in fact, so she's the end. And then we add tequila. And, she... and yet, tequila is what does it. Absolutely. And, you know, you might want to take an extra shot just for, you know. Anyway, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, engage you at this point. Any questions about the story? Any other questions about the now decimated <laughs> bar we have <laughs> All these ingredients, and I mean, can you show us? Yes, we are all lined up so perfectly. Color coded straws, I'm not quite sure what happened. <laughs> definitely went the way of everything else. Why did I tell Doug I would clean up today? <laughs> all right, I fell down on the job. I'll catch up. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have to stay clean up right <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? Any comments? Yeah. I, I just have to say that I made the um, Bosch cheese spritzer, but I don't like sweet drinks either. So I did grapefruit juice instead of the passion fruit. Really, really good. Yeah. Oh, God. Just, just really perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. That is it ready? And I think what, who said that? Who, who are you? Who, who, I don't have the camera. <laughs> I don't have the camera. <laughs> who said that? I, I'm Deborah. Hi. Hogsamea. Hudson, you know, Deborah, one of the I things. think Deborah's one of our visitors, right, Deborah? Oh, great. I am, yes. At the North Shore. Very, very happy to be here. Welcome. I'm actually from Providence. <laughs> oh, from Providence, okay. Well, welcome. You know, one of the things Thank about um, just what you said about using grip juice and said, I think is the essence of mixology yeah. and the essence of good cooking, which is you never have to feel like you are... Um, Tied down. If you don't have a certain ingredient, you can't do it. What you do is you cast about. You know what you taste. You know what you like, and to go for that. And I think you even made you, you made several. Of that. That's why I love making cocktails, and I hate baking because I <laughs> yeah <laughs> baking you can't substitute. Baking, you have to yes. because I, you can't substitute cocktails. Yeah. It's, it's an open-ended story. It's really true. So Stacey, you asked what my favorite was of all yeah, these. Yeah, all these. I think I have to do another quick round. <laughs> <laughs> no, just so I can. Forget it. <laughs> okay, we'll line them up and so then let's, so let's one start. of these. So this was not this was that This is a very refreshing margarita style. No, and it's hand not hand um hand. it's not you don't get the intensity of the alcohol. Not exactly. <laughs> and it tastes delicious. <laughs> And I could certainly imagine having such a dish. Such a well, that was the inspiration for the book, Margarita Mama, because I was pregnant and everyone was drinking margaritas but me. So I said, I'm going to come up with a non-alcoholic yeah, margarita. That's right. And 
thanks to Dan, the rest is history. All right, Dan. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, earlier, and this is? Vashti Spritzer. This is the beginning. That's and we'll line them all up at the end so people can see them. Oh, we've been drinking them kind of quickly. We'll replenish. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally see why a uh, grapefruit. Oh, is, absolutely. I think any fruit juice, juice, I have loved the idea of using the characters for inspiration. And so passion fruit and passion seem like the perfect match uh, yes. for Vashti, but absolutely. You could do cranberry in the fall if you wanted to make it more of a fall spritzer. Apple cider would work too. Okay, so number three was the Mordecai Smash. Nope, went over, right there. This is, this is the Negroni Mordecai. Yes, yeah. more. And this is a serious thing. Like, is, yeah, is it's not saying? for amateurs. You said sophisticated. No wonder I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Four and Alyssa, did, did you say that often this is served with a piece of like citrus, like a lemon? A lot of times it's served orange. with an orange rind. An orange. Absolutely. Um, I actually like to take orange slices and dehydrate them so they sort of form like a crispy wedge. They look pretty. I don't think any of those add a ton of flavor to it, but right. they definitely change the appearance, which is nice. I have to say this, in terms of a sophisticated drink, is <laughs> fabulous, just fabulous. Okay, you hammered. like this, Stacey. Yeah, okay, okay. Hammered, hammered Heyman. Hammered Heyman, this one. Oh, yeah. Boo. Oh. <laughs> Remind us of what's in the Heyman? The bourbon, the ancho rays, which is gonna give it a little bit of heat on the finish, bitters and lemon juice. And our bourbon drinker, Mark, likes this one. Interesting, oh, good. good to know. He loves it. And I think another thing when you're mixing cocktails, what you drink neat might be different than what you drink in a cocktail. So you can use sort of an everyday bourbon, a lower price point bourbon for these mixed drinks and save your better bourbons to drink um, neat or some people put one ice cube in. That's the last Well, that's a great question to ask, which is the extent to which that's the if you're mixing drinks, does it make sense to use your top shelf um, liquor for a mixed drink or but does it matter? There's a variety of answers to that. Some people would say to only put in a mixed drink what you would drink on its own. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I think taking a good bourbon as opposed to a great bourbon for a mixed drink, I think bourbons can get very high in the price range. And I yes. don't think that that's worth mixing with. You're gonna lose sort of the novelty of the different flavors and the unique bourbons. So I think like this Evan Williams one, any of those will work great as a mixing bourbon. Yeah, I think that's really, I think also in drinks that involve whiskey, that it's yeah, the same absolutely. thing. absolutely, the same thing. Like if you're going to malt scotch for a mixed drink, just Definitely. doesn't make sense to me. Right. We the have a question from uh, Lorette about the story. So um, Rabbi Stern, in the beginning, you talked about- Lorette. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, in the beginning, you talked about Vashti. And, you know, when you think about her bravery to say no, and she spins off this entire story, right? And then Queen Esther being this very strong woman as well, brave. And yet this story is like, there's no proof that it actually took place in history. So I, I find it interesting because we don't find many um, stories about strong women. And yet this story can't be... <laughs> you know, founded in anything of reality. So I, I don't know, I just want to know more about your thoughts, um, you know, about the women in this and its juxtaposition to, you know, so many of the stories of, of our culture, religion, people. I, I, I mean, you know, the truth is that we could do, maybe we should do a whole, you know, series of classes and conversations about women and their portrayal in our texts and who they are and the extent to which they're either secondary, tertiary, or otherwise invisible. And yet how essential, beyond the obvious reasons, how essential they are to uh, Judaism and the Jewish way of life and how what they transmit uh, to their partners, what they transmit to their children and their involvement in all of it is really part of the untold story, as well as women who were more deeply involved than we are classically taught. I mean, in a way, it's similar, I think. We haven't had such a thing, I don't think, to what's happening for, uh, for Black folks in terms of Black women who were involved in major things that 
we knew nothing about. I mean, I, I forget the name of the movie. Hidden Figures. Yeah. Hidden Figures. <laughs> that the, the, the there was a black woman so intricately, so essentially involved uh, in um, America's uh, race uh, to space and the way she was treated. It's an extraordinary movie and it, it really reveals the extent to which there are so many stories we have yet to learn. Look, when we had um, the Brave Theater Company from LA who was here this past weekend and told stories of Jews of color and what, they're, what they have lived through, who they are, it's part of our, you know, part of our story, the, the, the Jewish story, and it's so complex, and there's so many parts to it. And often it, it, it's taken a long time to hear them. I, I do think there are so many stories to hear about extraordinary women who have made a difference in shaping Jewish life. In, in a way, you know, um, I think for instance, uh, in classic Jewish text, Rebecca is not necessarily called a hero, but any woman who's carried twins uh, to full gestation or, or, or uh, an early birth, I mean, that's its own heroism. Having a child is its own heroism is its own, you know, unique way of, not only the, again, the obvious being fruitful multiplying, but what it means to carry a child to term, particularly in ancient times, when the risks were extraordinary, where in fact, so many, so many children died uh, close to their birth, that in Jewish law, you're not permitted, and you know, and I, so you're not permitted to mourn an infant if they're less than 30 days old, mm -hmm. which sounds cruel and terrible. But if you think about the laws related to mourning in Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. and that it restricts what people can do and where they can go and work and et cetera, you realize that what percentage of people would be in mourning all the time? Because of course women gave birth and lost so many children along the way. All of which is to say is, you know, how, how do we define heroism, how do we define a sense of the, the, the proper place of Jewish women? I, I think that Esther, uh, who is Jewish and Vash Jewish, not, who is not Jewish, both portray for the reader a kind of um, determination that you know, I, I would say has always been part of Jewish life, but not particular. But since the men have classically until, you know, 20th century have been the guys that tell the story, it has tended to be told from a, uh, that kind of patriarchal perspective. When in fact, now that we have so many Jewish women who are scholars and who are demanding a kind of, uh, I don't even want to say equal time, we were demanding that the story be broadened to give a fuller range of the truth that I think we will continue to see um, the role of Jewish women um, um, raised up and examined and studied and you know, hopefully uh, taught to our children and our children's children because that's, because the, the full story has to be told and, and you bring up a really important point. Amen. Women's History Month. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Any other uh, questions or comments, concerns? No, okay. I just want people, uh, Alyssa, give your website out for people that may be interested oh, in learning more. Mocktalesformomstobe.com. Um, and they can also contact me directly through the Temple Directory for events or I have books. Books are available at bookstores and online. We have events. Tell us about the events. You They're have. usually private events. So I'm happy to talk to people about private events. You um, come up with signature cocktails for weddings and things like that. Signature cocktails for events or happy to bartend and sort of present signature cocktails at a private event. What a deal. I didn't even know that. This is terrific. <laughs> I'll be a bar What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell me about some green cocktails. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Well, I would say thank you so oh, much. This has been so much this fun. Was, you were so terrific. It's so great to learn all this and just get a range. And, and just a word about drinking also. So I know there's, there's so many issues about there. I know there are people that feel very um, diffident about talking about drinking and doing it in the way we do, which is very enthusiastic about it. And I wanna, I wanna just clarify that yes, it's absolutely wonderful and terrific. And also, we also understand that there are limits and people have to drink in a very smart way. And that we understand that um, alcohol can have terrible, uh, terrible effects on people who are um, prone to alcoholism or other things. So I, I don't wanna be like, 
Oh yeah, everybody should go out and drink. I mean, we had, it, it, we have the mocktail. Exactly right. It's all about um, responsibility and you know certainly enjoying and having a good time, but also understanding that, that there are boundaries. Stacy, this is a great job for a past president. <laughs> yeah. So you should all be uh, involved in the board because look, right. you could one day you, you be my boss. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Happy Purim, everybody. Happy Purim. Take care. Good night, everybody. Lila Tove. Lila Tove. Thanks, everybody, for joining.